So we'll begin here in just a moment if uh, the panelists could uh, kindly uh, turn their videos on. That would be wonderful. And let me make sure I've got speaker. Matthew and Dr. Basu. Okay, so we we do have uh, attendees that are, are signed in and with us and a few more that are logging in, but let us begin uh, as it is nine o'clock here in uh, New York time and 7.30 in India. So we'll start on time and I would just like to welcome um, you all to this third in a series of seven evening webinars in celebration of the mothers and Auroville's birth anniversary. And as you know, this series continues until February 28th, Auroville's birth anniversary. 
and is part of the Auroville Festival and hosted by Auroville Foundation in collaboration with LaGrasse Center USA. My name is Rade and I'm with the LaGrasse Center here in Fountain Inn, South Carolina. It is my honor to be your moderator for today's session. So before we begin our session, may I call for a moment of collective silence in support of Ukraine. As you know, Russia invaded Ukraine today. And so let us concentrate and send a prayer for peace, for compassion, and for victory of truth. So the topic that will be addressed today by our three esteemed guests, Dr. Nada Reddy, Matthew Andrews, and Dr. Sumitra Basu, is research of the soul of nations and national pavilions. In Sri Aurobindo's human cycle and the ideal of human unity, the term nation soul was first introduced by applying a shift to a more loving relations of brotherhood in a larger community where the soul of nation is the key. In the chapter Nation and Empire, Real and Political Unities, Shiobindo identifies nation as a real unity based on common psychology, land, language, and culture. It allows the psychic beings of the individuals to relate to one another in a more direct and efficient way through the means of common language and culture developing the sense of fraternity and brotherhood. Sri Aurobindo compares it to the three steps of Vishnu. The first step is the development of love and care within the family, the second within the nation, and the third and highest, the development of love and care within the humanity. In this way, the ideal of human unity can be realized only through an intermediary stage of the conscious development of nations and their souls. And on this concept of Sri Aurobindo's, the mother envisioned the whole international zone of Auroville dedicated to different national pavilions, where Aurovillians as citizens of the world could learn about different nations, their cultures, folklore, cuisines, and more. It was meant to help develop a sense of brotherhood among the nations. And so with this brief introduction to the topic, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our guest speakers today, Dr. Ananda Reddy, Matthew Andrews, and again, Dr. Sumitra Basu. Dr. Ananda Reddy heads the Sri Aurobindo Center for Advanced Research, SACAR, located in Pondicherry, where he conducts research and online courses in Sri Aurobindo's thought. Dr. Ananda's expertise lies in the interpretations of the Aurobindonian philosophy and he has to his credit more than 2,000 hours of recorded talks on Sri Aurobindo's major works, such as The Life Divine, Synthesis of Yoga, Essays on the Gita, and Savitri. Matthew Andrews, who will be our second guest speaker today, is co-director of Shraddha Yoga and board president of Auroville International USA. He has been a student of yoga philosophy in the light of Sri Aurobindo and the mother for over 20 years and teaches yoga philosophy in yoga teacher training. He has organized and hosted retreats in Auroville and at the Madhuban Sri Aurobindo Ashram. 
Matthew expresses his devotion and love for the divine through music that weaves Western folk traditions with Sanskrit and Tamil mantras. And our third speaker for today, Dr. Sumitra Basu. Dr. Sumitra Basu is a psychiatrist working with consciousness paradigms. He conducts workshops on personal growth and is founder, editor of Namaha and author of the book, Integral Health. He is deeply interested in the interplay of Aurobindonian metaphysics and mental health. Dr. Basu has developed a module of consciousness-based psychology, and along with Dr. Michael Miovich, has authored a book on this topic, which looks at the psychopathology and counseling from an entirely new perspective that arises from the experiential teachings of Shirobindo and the mother. So once again, I'd like to welcome our esteemed panelists, Dr. Ananda Reddy, Matthew Andrews, and Dr. Sumitra Basu. Before handing it over to Dr. Ananda Reddy, our first guest speaker, please note, uh, attendees, that there will be time for questions towards the end of this webinar. So uh, be sure to post any of your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, if it is to be directed to a specific panelist, uh, please note as part of your question. So at this time, uh, I'd like to turn it over to you. Dr. Reddy. Thank you. Yeah, long many years back, I was somehow involved in the international zone of Uruguay. I attended a couple of meetings in, in USA as well as in Europe. It's since then that my interest in the study of nation soul. I started the study, in fact. It was really difficult to understand what do we mean by the nation's soul or the soul of a nation. But then everything becomes clear <clears throat> by a single sentence from Sri Aurobindo. The nation or society, like the individual, has a body, an organic life, a moral and aesthetic temperament, a developing mind and a soul behind all these signs and powers for the sake of which they exist. So we see there is a complete parallel between the nation's soul and an individual human being. Parallel in the sense, just as the individual has a soul which is his primary essential personality and then the rest of the things all that we think of the economics or his, or his activities and art and culture, all the human expressions are nothing but an expression of the human soul. Similarly, a nation also or the nation's soul also has all these kinds of activities, economic and politics and army and whatever you want to say. These are all nothing but the expressions of the soul of a nation. Where Sherwin would emphasize to say that in fact, a nation is essentially a soul rather than has one. So it, in his philosophy we see it's exactly the same thing. So once we understand individual soul, the same soul there on the national level also. But exactly as in the level of uh, the individual, Shravan says, once having attained to a separate distinction, distinctness, must become more and more self-conscious and find itself more and more fully as it develops its corporate action and mentality and its organic self-expressive life. The important thing is, Shreven says, it, it must be self-conscious and find itself first of all. Like the individual also is the same thing. We are not be, becoming full instruments of the soul until we really find the psychic being and our own purpose. So in this level also, now, how does it find this separate distinction? There are stages of that. It's not that at one go, the nation becomes a soul, or, or find its soul. There's a distinctness. So there also there are phases of physical, vital, mental, and then the nation becomes mature and finds its own soul distinctness. So once we understand this major concept, it becomes easy to see what's the nation's soul and what are its expressions. This is very important to understand because we are trying to discuss in those days what should we represent in an international zone. 
But you know, is it just the cooking or the dancing or the arts expression? Yes, of course they are there. But how do you distinguish it? There's an important question. Somebody asked, so how do you find a nation's soul? You know, externally we have all kinds of activities. And the mother and Shri Aurobindo would emphasize on this aspect that in order to find the nation's soul, you have to find your own psychic being. Nation soul, or the alternative word is a psychic being, just as we say our soul or the psychic being. So the, the way to find the nation soul is to have one's own experience of one's own soul. And secondly, just as the human being also has phases where the soul leaves one body and then it takes a rebirth. And the same thing happens in a nation also. It says every nation the soul comes with an entity, with a clarity, but at a point it leaves that body, it withdraws, then comes back in a new body. So we have many examples in history, we don't have time to go into that. For example, Egypt is there, the Middle East is there, some of these countries where we have seen great cultures like Egypt, like Pharaohs, but now it has come in a new body. So this is a continuation that happens, a rebirth of a nation soul also is there. Now thirdly, one point that I'd like, like to link up this with, with India. India has been a perennially an eternal soul like all other souls, but unlike many countries, it, its soul has not withdrawn. I mean, it has not really gone back into its own universal cosmic soul, but it has remained, but sometimes it has withdrawn in its external expression. So we see in India funny places, a lot of Mughal invasion, British invasion and all that. But it has absorbed all these things and India has a great cha challenge to take new forms with each other. And in that, if you remember the mission, the five dreams of Sri Aurobindo, with the third dream he speaks of the human unity. And that is where again Sri Aurobindo emphasizes that her presence, that means India's presence, may make all the difference that means India's rebirth as a spiritual nation will make a difference in the world unity. And in the last dream of the, of the new creation, again it says that India will take a, could take a lead. So the message there seems to be that for world unity, India is needed very essentially because of its spiritual message. And now I understand its relation with Oroville. You see, Oroville, the mother, has started not just because of a new city, the city the earth needs. Why did she say the earth needs? Because this experiment of human unity had to be done in India because of its spiritual background and its Indian soul, the nation soul of India, which is behind this experiment of Oroville. That's what I understand. Because it is trying to manifest its new form. What all it has gone through, the nation soul of the country, it is self trying to manifest a human unity and Orwell is that expression. With all its present problems and whatever difficulties come across the line, we have to see that it is India's soul that is there. And the last dream when Sri Aurobindo says is a new consciousness, that's again what the mother said, that India will be the cradle of a new consciousness. So now I see the full link between a nation soul and India's soul and Orwell and international soul. And the internet has known one particular line before I leave. That is, what Sri Aurobindo said, we have to first find out that each nation has a specific raison there. So in the international zone, people are trying, the architects are trying, the European zone, Asiatic zone, this zone, American zone, no. It's no more this kind of a political grouping together. We have to find out what exactly is the nation soul's aspiration, what is its demand, what is its what is this expression? Then only club them at the international zone. Otherwise, it's not just a question of calling them a federation of notions, a nations, or a grouping of nations, you know, because they belong to Europe or they belong to NATO or they belong. It's no more a political division. So here is the challenge that Oroville International Zone has to face. Find out the nation's soul. It's a huge research. You know, just to say we can willy nilly somehow put them together. So the architects of the Internet Zone 
have to get into this and then into the nation soul. And there is also a little provision because there are some nation souls who have, which have had an impact with another culture, another nation soul. So we could at least bring them together. That's the, at the, that's the best thing we can do. But otherwise, the international zone has to be developed not only rationally but with a deeper insight. And then the last sentence that I said before that we have to find the international zone, the nation soul, by a contact within ourselves. And that perhaps is one of the things that's lacking in Oroville at present. Until and unless we at Oroville, all the Orovillians inside and outside, we find a deeper truth within us, the external international zone will not manifest. That's why it's been 50 years, nothing has been done except the inauguration of a few you know, pavilions here and there. So Oroville itself is a venture, is an adventure into finding one's own deeper consciousness. Until and unless that is done, all the superstructures of international zone, cultural zone will take its own time. So this is the link I find between the research of the nation soul and the international zone and the countries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. Our second uh, panelist, Matthew, I'd like to turn it over to you, please. Thank you, Rade. And uh, thank you, Dr. Reddy, for highlighting um, the fact that the mother said, and also the reality that in order to know a nation's soul or any soul, we have to start by knowing our own soul. And in this way, talking about a soul, we can't just use abstractions. We can't just use ordinary words. Uh, we, have to, we have to approach it in a different kind of way. Our habitual mental way of thinking, we can't think our way into contact with a soul. And Dr. Uh, Radhe at the beginning um, spoke about the importance or the kind of centrality of love and care in uh, human relations and the fact that as the soul, as, as we develop an understanding of our own soul and as nations develop an understanding or an experience, a tangible embodied experience of their own souls, love and care are the natural outcomes of that. So when we think about how do we touch the soul of a nation, how do we know the soul of a nation? First, we have to know what soul is and we do that through ourselves. We do that by going inside. You know, there's all kinds of artifacts that reflect what a nation's soul is trying to express. Every soul is an essence and uniquely constructed divine essence that is trying to express itself within the realm of time and space. And so we can look at the artifacts, the culture, the language, the laws, the music, the food, as Dr. Reddy was saying, we can look at all these artifacts as ways that the soul is seeking and sometimes succeeding in, in manifesting itself and bringing itself forward and offering its unique fragrance to the collective. So those are the outer manifestations, but what is behind them? What is, uh, you know, what's the space from which they come? And the only way we can touch that space is by knowing our own souls and through our hearts and through love, the natural relationship of any part to its whole, the natural relationship of your cells to your body, to your being, the natural relationship of your liver and your stomach to the wholeness that is you is love. We've gotten into this habitual scientific thinking, and I use the word science uh, not about the scientific method, which is incredibly valuable, but the fundamentalist dogma of materialism that says that there's just a machine going on here. My relationship to the earth, gravity is a mathematical equation. Gravity is not a mathematical equation. Gravity is the earth holding you against her because she loves you, because you are part of her, because she gave birth to you. So this is, love is not uh, an abstraction or an idea or a function. Love is the actual organic 
reality of re relationships between parts that relate to each other, parts in relationship to the whole, and the whole in the relationship to the parts that it has given birth to. Uh, Sri Aurobindo said that the soul is greater than its instruments and cannot be shut up in a physical, vital, mental, or temperamental formula. So the soul is the wholeness that connects and what it, the, the fabric of the connection is love. So how do we touch in to this love? How do we experience this love? Well, what do we, you know, we, what do you love? Just think of something that you love. Think of someone that you love, a family member, a tree, a pet, an animal, uh, a, a place, the mother, the earth, we can easily touch into the experience of loving and allow that to inform and open the faculty of sensing that is the heart that can provide a pathway to knowing the soul. And then we see the outpicturing of the artifacts of that soul, whether it's a person or a nation, for what they are, the reflections of this deeper radiance, this inner presence that just proclaims, I am, I am, and this is who I am. This is the uniqueness of my being. Every nation, whether or not they're embodying that soul, has a soul. Every nation, every person, whether or not they're embodying the qualities of their soul, is a soul. And, you know, Paramahansa Ramakrishna famously said, uh, the difference between the, the jnani and the vigyani. The jnani is the one who knows that God exists. The one who knows beyond a doubt that a log of wood contains fire in it. That's a jnani, right? They know. But the vigyani is the one who takes the log of wood and extracts the fire and makes, cooks a meal on it and is nourished. The jnani so he said, some have drunk milk, some have heard of milk. Uh, sorry, some have, some have seen milk, some have heard of milk, and some have drunk milk. The Vijnani has drunk the milk. And so in our, own, in our own way, in our own being, if we want to touch the soul, if we want to uh, directly experience what the soul of another person or another nation is, we have to drink the milk of love. We can't just talk about it. We can't just think about it. We can't just observe it, we have to drink it. So we enter this, this relationship in our own hearts with love itself and allow that love to, to connect us to the soul of a nation. We can look at you know, the soul of America. What is the soul of America? And of course, a soul is not black and white and exclusive. It's not one thing or another in kind of strict linear ways. One, one nation doesn't just reflect one principles and another nation and other principles. But the soul of America, the United States of America, it, uh, there's this seeking to express about the individual liberty, the desire for each individual to have the capacity and space and freedom to express themselves. And on the deeper level, this is the soul expression. Every soul should be able to express itself. And you can contrast that with the, the soul quality of India that says that true freedom comes through self-offering, not through self-aggrandizement, but through self-offering and the sublimation of personal desire to divine adoration, uh, desire for the, for the divine, aspiration for the divine. So we have these two seemingly opposing, you know, individual liberty versus self-offering. They're actually two wings of the same bird. They can't exist without each other. They are dependent on each other and our existence is dependent on both of them coming together. But one is manifested more strongly through the being of one nation and one is manifested more strongly through the being of another nation. And just like two individuals, if these nations can offer freely embody and offer that wisdom, every soul exists not for its own glory, but to offer every soul. The natural state of every soul is how can I help? How can I give? to the wholeness? How can I express myself in a way that serves? 
And so every nation, it's the same way the expression, the fullness of an expression of a nation's soul is going to serve. It's going to offer something to the wholeness. And if these two different nations can offer their essential being, then we have an earth that can partake of these two different qualities, these two wings of the bird and the wings can flap and the bird can fly. Soul is the timeless essence, the unharmable essence that's seeking to express itself. And when a nation is not embodying its soul and when a person is not embodying its soul, their soul, it's easy to say, it's easy to focus on the limitations. It's easy to focus on, you know, it become hopeless or cynical because we say, oh, these, this may, we can say these are the sole qualities of the United States of America, uh, liberty and self-expression or, you know, uh, equality. All people are created equal. Well, the United States has certainly not embodied that uh, statement, that quality, all people are created equal. There's been an immense injustice in the way the United States has treat, treated uh, people here, especially people of African descent, and also people throughout the world. But that limitation does not, it obscures the radiance of the soul. But it doesn't mean there is no soul. It doesn't mean that the soul isn't there. It doesn't mean that it, it, there's just uh, empty words. The words, the founding principles of the United States, and I would also say, you know, in India, it's not the same. I, I wouldn't point as much to founding principles as I would say the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita and Ramayana. These ancient wisdom texts that hold these qualities of soul so deeply that you know, the Upanishads point to the invisible reality out of which all visible, everything that we see and touch and smell and hear emerges and the invisible unity, the Brahman that unites all creation. This is the essence of the Upanishads. And this is part of the soul of India. This is an expression. And part isn't really the best word because it's a segmenting, but it's an expression of the soul of India. It's that with, within India, which seeks to express itself. And so these words, even though India hasn't fully embodied and isn't always fully embodying these words, doesn't mean that they're, they're, the soul isn't there behind the veil, always trying to express. And so what can we do as individuals and what can national pavilions do in Oroville? Well, they can honor and call forth the soul, even of a nation that is confused, that is lacking, that is limited in its soul expression and in its subjectivity and its recognition of its own soul and the, the soul qualities of others. And the, the fact that every soul was created for a purpose and should be honored and valued so that it can express that purpose. Even a nation that's confused about that instead of kind of lamenting or dismissing or diminishing, you know, just like with another person, if there's someone we don't agree with, we can diminish them, we can mock them, we can deride them, we can resent them, we can reject them, or we can hold firmly the knowledge that they are a soul. And we can love, allow love, and love isn't, you know, uh, uh, love isn't like a sentimentality. Love isn't allowing or condoning someone's actions but love is the co fierce commitment to not allowing destructive diminishing energies to move through us and to instead align ourselves with generation with saying i recognize and honor the soul quality that is at the essence of you even though you aren't expressing that right now without any sense of superiority or domination, it's holding the reality, the underlying reality of the being, of the nation, of the person with love and remaining firmly committed to that while all the vital and mental layers of our own selves try to pull us in a different direction. So we can have conversations and we can have an abstract 
you know, thought about soul and about relationships of soul of nations, or we can within ourselves commit to loving, honoring, revealing, revering the soul of every nation and of every being at all times and rooting out that in us, which would pull us in the other direction, acknowledging that which in us will pull us in another direction, shifting our alignment away from uh, desecrating or mocking or diminishing in any way the soul of another and aligning ourselves with upholding, honoring, revering the soul of another. Right now, well, I'll just say one thing, which is that the, the absence, love is, is generative and love is harmonizing and love creates life, creates health in our bodies. When our souls, when our cells love the wholeness of our being, we're healthy. When our body systems and functions are functioning with love, we're healthy. When we love the earth, the earth is healthy. When nations love each other, there's harmony. Now the breakdown of love and the, the shift to de degeneration uh, means in our bodies, disharmony and disease. It means on the earth, climate, ecological problems, when we aren't in love with the earth. And when nations are not in love with each other, we have war. And today, it's a poignant and painful reality that today, one nation has invaded another nation, has initiated an act of war. And this can only come from the separation from the reality, the underlying truth. I mean, this is the thing is love isn't something we impose. Love is the truth. Love is the organic underlying reality of existence. And we can deny that. We can reject that. We can separate ourselves from that. But it doesn't become untrue. It doesn't become unreal. It's ourselves who have entered into an illusion. And when one nation invades another nation and uh, invalidates its sovereignty, it's the same thing. And today we have that reality that, that is happening. And in the face of that, we can be afraid, of course. We can be angry, of course. But we can also root ourselves in the firm commitment and conviction that these two nations are souls, both of them. They are manifestations of divine radiance, holy, sacred, divine radiance manifesting itself in a collective on a large scale. And beneath whatever veneer, whatever illusion, the people and the systems and structures of that nation are putting forward right now, that soul remains. That soul has not been diminished, it has not been harmed, it has not been destroyed. It is unharmable and indestructible. And light will prevail. Truth will prevail. Always. And the Upanishad, the uh, Mundaka Upanishad says, Satya meva jayate, nanritam. Truth will always prevail. Light will always prevail. Love will always prevail. We are pulled into conflict. We are pulled into moments of purification where all the dark and unloving and untruthful things within us need to be purged and brought to the surface. These moments happen. They're passages. This is not the end state. We're not heading downhill into a dark bottomless abyss. When there's a conflict, when, there's, when the darkness is drawn to the surface, we need to bear witness. We need to keep our hearts open and we need to root in the, the, our, our faith, our shraddha, in the victory of light and the victory of truth, which is inevitable, as the mother said countless times. The victory is assured. So whatever we see happening on the outside, that doesn't mean we don't feel pain. It doesn't mean that we, don't, that we reject our human emotions that we don't stand with people who are suffering and hold them in our hearts and accept the reality of that. But it means that we do it without hopelessness and despair. We do it with hope. Hope is the most powerful force in the face of uh, darkness and untruth. 
because hope is that which rejects the voice of the darkness, the voice of the darkness, the voice of death in savitry, which so poignantly, poignantly conveys the, the illusion that all is fallen, all is permanently fallen and permanently falling apart, and that's all there is. And savitry says no, so clearly, so firmly, so without any wavering, no. Love is real. You speak the truth that slays, I speak the truth that saves. We each have the opportunity and the responsibility at this time as much as any other to align ourselves with the truth that saves and to speak the truth that saves at any moment, any opportunity that we have. And national pavilions can be an embodiment of the truth that saves, the truth of the soul of every nation and honoring of the soul of every nation that every nation is a soul and that soul is seeking expression and will find that expression. So the pavilion can be a, a kind of an incubator, a place where that expression of that national soul can find embodiment on earth and then it can ripple out and that the whole fabric of the earth can be blessed by the progressive embodiment of these nation souls. I'm very honored to, to have the opportunity to share my heart with you all today. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Very, very well said. And uh, you can probably see in the chat, a few people are, are thanking you also for the beautiful uh, explanation. Um, very nice, thank you, beautiful, so, et cetera. So very, very well put and uh, appreciate. Um, coming from that perspective of love. Uh, before turning it over to Dr. Basu, I just want to remind everyone to uh, please, um, any questions that you might have of our, our guest speakers today, to put in the Q&A box, because we will have time uh, to, uh, to answer your, your questions. And so with that, uh, Dr. Basu, I'd like to hand it over to you. Thank you, Radhe, and thank you everyone for giving me this opportunity. And I think it is very special for Auroville um, and from the perspective even of and uh, from the occult point also, because today being a day when the uh, when war started between two nations, which were part of, which were together at one time. And um, from this perspective, you see that we start and uh, I would say that uh, already uh, Anandada, Dr. Ananda Reddy, my esteemed senior and uh, our, our senior sadhak of our ashram and Matthew has very, they have both of them beautifully spelled out the basic things. And uh, so they have made my task easier. So I would be saying the other things that are left. I say that if you see from Shirobindu's perspective, he was concerned with, uh, uh, a very important thing throughout the ideal of human unity, which was to find out how the individuality and the collectivity could be harmonized. For so that is that this this harmony between the individual and the collectivity has not been perfectly achieved till now, and that was showing those uh, what you call a uh, very great concern. And um, if you uh, if you ask me to analyze that uh, the, uh, one of the reasons of the external reasons are there, of course, for the collapse of the USSR, but one of the internal reasons, if you say, if you see from this perspective, from the individual perspective of the collapse of USSR was that though this, that theory that held the USSR had, been, had attempted to analyze the conflict between the classes in a very uh, brilliant way, but the conflict between the individual and the collectivity was not analyzed, was not because it, 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 it doesn't need only an analysis, it needs a synthesis. And this synthesis has to come from a spiritual perspective. Remember when Mother and Shirobindo are talking about human unity, they are talking about the unity of the world, they are not talking in terms of mere politics. You see, otherwise Mother would not have said on January 18, 1964, January 18, 1964, as far as that time, she said that for a long, long time, she was working so that the USSR and the USA would be coming together, means finishing the war, Cold War. So you see, she was putting a spiritual uh, force 
into that uh, act that for the sake of world unity, that uh, the USA and the USSR, they have to resolve their conflicts. And she was putting her, uh, what you call, her power into it, her strength into it, her aspirations into it. So it's not merely a political uh, affair. It's a very big spiritual affair. And that's why the soul of the nations, what we are talking about, becomes a very important thing. And then talking about nationality, just before uh, Sri Aurobindo wrote, the, uh, started writing the idol of human unity, he talked about a new nationalism, which India is going to offer in his Uttar Para speech after he came out from his prison. He was imprisoned, you know, <coughs> and in 1980, <coughs> 1908 to 1909. And when he came out, he gave a famous speech, which is known as Uttar Para speech, where he talks about the new nationalism. And that new nationalism is to be based on what he called the Sanatan Dharma, which means spiritual universalism. That means each nation has to bring something unique to the orchestra of world nations. And for India, it was to bring the, uh, the spiritual universalism as an ideal, you know, because, uh, as a peculiarity of the nationhood of India. Or, or the, and that can something that can uh, flow directly from the soul of the nation, which is being represented. So, and, and the beauty of it is that if that spiritual universalism could be introduced as India's new nationalism to the orchestra of world nations, then it would be easier to uh, what you call shift from nationalism to internationalism without sacrificing your national uniqueness. You see, you have to shift from nationalism to internationalism without sacrificing your national uniqueness. This, this is important because some, some person might say, I don't care about nations. I believe in world citizenship. I'm a world citizen. I, I, I'm beyond nations, beyond all regional uh, groupings, and beyond all, uh, uh, what do you call, all types of conglomerations of people. I belong to the whole world. Why I should be, why sh I should be sticking to the nation only? Why you are uh, bringing, pulling me down? I, I will belong to the universal soul, not to the soul of the nation. You see, of course, somebody can say that. That is all right, but that is also, another aspect of reality. You see, it is not different. Being and be the soul of the, the global soul and the soul of the nation, they are not separate from each other. It is the same thing in different poisons, one has to understand. You see, as an individual, I can outgrow all my nations and I can forget my nationhood. But my, as an individual, I am not representing the whole humanity. The whole humanity is being represented by the mass of people. And people there, uh, people have all sorts of inclinations, all sorts of what you call ideas. People have hooked to their uh, uh, heritage, and you cannot just get over that. So a much better way to uh, participate in the harmony of the world is to go to your international arena, but with, the, with your nationalism there, the spirit of your nationalism there, but in a sense that uh, the true spirit of nationalism, whereas uh, Matthew was telling that uh, we have to view others no? also in the same way with love. It is, it is a, that is why uh, it is very important that uh, we speak today, especially in Auroville, because I think that Auroville is an experimental uh, space where the shift from nationalism to internationalism without foregoing our national identities, that can be possible, is, that is possible. In fact, that is why the national pavilions no? that have been kept in this uh, in Auroville, which mother wanted that these national pavilions comes, the people should know the other nationalities, other nations that, uh, that uh, comes to a full circle, that comes to a full meaning. But before we uh, talk about something else about the soul of nation, I will just talk about how Shirobin the view how the nation grows, because it is necessary. You see, the soul of a nation, suddenly the soul of a nation doesn't develop. It takes time to develop. The soul of a nation doesn't automatically develop one day. It takes a long time. So then Sri said that there were stages. So the first stage is a amorphous stage, a nascent stage, where everything is still in a disorganized way. Everything is not organized. And a nation has to be formed. So the first thing that is needed is a type of social stratification. So first thing that happens is a social stratification. All these things before the nation soul starts getting consolidated. You see the social stratification has to happen, which in the West happened with the royalty, the clergy, the bourgeois and the proletariat, and in India with the fourfold system of the caste, the caste system, the fourfold order of the society. And of course, it's much misinterpreted. The real interpretation is not considered. 
But if we see, it was very important because the Shirvan they very beautifully explained that the Islamic nations, because though Islam believed in equality and brotherhood, they could not consolidate as nations very nicely because the social stratification was absent until modern conditions forced them to be to think in a different way and to consolidate as nations in keeping with the modern spirit of the world. So he gives that example, which is a case study. You can see it is a case study. And the second stage is when, uh, and this is the first stage was that nascent stage, and the second stage is that stage where a admi centralized administration has to occur, something the administration has to consolidate in a centralized way, and a political self-consciousness has to develop. And here it is uh, where India uh, has to be studied separately, because in India it was the spiritual self-consciousness that developed, not the political self-consciousness, as it happened in other places of the world. That also shows in the experience. Uh, very beautiful there. What is the significance? And what it, and that is why today from India we have to take the start of describing or, or, or take, talking about the soul of the nation. And then the third stage is, comes, the third stage comes there, the soul of the nation begins to consolidate in the third stage. In the third stage, when a little bit of vital and mental unity has been achieved, then the stereotype has to be broken. As Shabindu says that the stereotype has to be broken, and the stereotype has to be broken by a sense of liberty. And the one wants liberty in many areas, like the liberty in the social religious sphere, liberty in the social political sphere, liberty in the social economic sphere, and people want to uh, freely design their own things. And that then that can be chaos. And that chaos only can be averted if side by side, peri pasu, the soul of the nation develops. If the soul of the nation develops, it's consolidated at that time, then even though there might be outward problems, then these outer problems can be handled very efficiently, or even a harmony can come there very efficiently. As you say that Sri Aurobindo said in the Idol of Human Unity, when he in the chapter on the religion of humanity, he says that there are three godheads. There are three godheads no, under which the soul acts, and the three godheads are the godheads of liberty, equality, and fraternity. But these three are always in conflict with each other, not liberty and equality. Liberty and equality are in conflict with each other. We know that. Liberty from liberty has come the concept of uh, the democracy from equality. Socialism has got uh, so, so much sustenance, but then they two they are the two that are what you call uh, uh, having conflicts within each other. And the real conflict can only be solved if the third principle, fraternity, is is developed. And that fraternity can only develop not in mechanical way, but as a soul comradeship. And that is why when Dr. Anandar Reddy started his talk today, he talked about that to find the soul of the nation, you have to find, you have to uh, discover your own psychic being. Because to base the community, base the community on a soul kinship, on a soul comradeship, one has to find one's own psychic being. Otherwise, you can't approach that. It is too fraternity, no? It is too fraternity based on soul comradeship that will break, that will bring about the perfect harmony between liberty and equality, then we can say that the soul of the nation is performing in the way it should do. Having said that, now I will just ask, uh, I will just raise this also this topic. If the soul of the nation, what we are talking is, is so vibrant, is so important, then what happens? What happens when that nation is no more there or that conglomeration of nations is no more there? What happened to the soul of USSR when it got dissolved? Or what happened to the soul of the United India when, when, when India got partitioned? You see that one can ask this question. Now for India, I can say, for India, you can say that Sri Aurobindo's uh, message that he gave in, the, on, uh, in a, uh, the Independence Day message that he gave, that, that the hint is there, as he says that uh, the spirit of this subcontinent can only be found if there is a unity, but the unity cannot be in the old way. The unity has to come in a new way. He has said that the unity has to come on in a practical way. It has to come in a very practical way, uh, in a, uh, uh, just not shouting what you call uh, very big words, but to see just the practical areas where we can collaborate with each other to find. Was, she was hinting was a sort of confederation. You know, he was very uh, um, comfortable with the idea of confederation. He had written the United States of Europe, that very famous chapter which is in 1917, he had written that very important chapter, the United States of Europe. And after that, the European uh, community, the European Union came in just the way 
it was told, of course, the European Union was conceived by many people before Sri Aurobindo, but Sri Aurobindo conceived it in a very practical way. And in that very practical way, you see afterwards that the whole phenomenon came out. So even that confederation of nations to be successful, then each nation must have its soul, it, uh, must find its soul. Otherwise, they cannot come and they cannot contribute to that orchestra of nations or to that confederation in a very viable way. Because even in their confederation, as Matthew said, that if love is not there between nations, nothing can work out. So to bring that love also, you have to come with your soul. Empty of your soul, empty of your soul, a nation cannot come there and contribute to the union of the world or the, the world unity. So you cannot do that. So that is a very also a very, very interesting thing, very important thing. I think that um, uh, Auroville particularly is a very interesting area. There is a very interesting area because it is symbolical. It is very, very symbolical of human unity. You know? In every way, it is symbolical of human unity. But as I said, we, we were, uh, the topic that I raised that when uh, Sri Aurobindo gives this uh, impression, that the subcontinent, uh, which goes by the name of um, India, and as mother had earmarked the boundaries of mother India. You see, mother had made a special map, which is not in accordance with the political maps of the three countries, but which includes the three, which includes all the countries, uh, all the countries that have separated from the mainland. And she says that the divine, what do you call, the divine uh, arena is this, which, which, which mother earmarked. So we can say that the soul of India represents or is represented or in that big area in that which mother has earmarked as the spiritual map of India. Now for the USSR, it is difficult to say, as Vladimir explains to me, that USSR was a conglomeration of very different, many, many nations came there together. It was not a single nation. So it is very difficult to say. And because if, if that is so, that there were many nations which came together and they were just kept together. And... Uh, Minus spirituality, or any minus any spiritual initiative, they were kept together. Then they would be, they would fall apart, and then you you, you would not be able to control that 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 falling up uh, that falling apart. You must remember that mother was once asked. The mother was once asked about why the family, why the family disintegrates, why the family is disintegrating. The family is disintegrating, she said, all over the world because the family was the first collective unit which was given a, a, a grace to grow as a collective as a collective unit. You see, there are many collective units. The nation is a collective unit. The clan is a collective unit. The family is a collective unit. The family as the first collective unit was given an opportunity to grow towards the truth, but it failed. And because it failed, the family has to break everywhere so that a new type of family is formed. A new type of family is formed, a family based on soul kinship, where you are connected by the other members of an extended universal family to your soul. So like that, if a nation also fails to serve that, uh, what you call that ideal of growing up together in a cohesive way, that nation also can have the same, uh, what you call, uh, the consequence as the family as having today breaking apart. So we have to be come together. We have to be very conscious that our our our, our soul is the, is not only present in a in an individual sphere. We have our collective sphere where the collective soul is also present, and it is our duty not only to work for our individual soul. But if, if my ideal is human unity, then I have to work also for the soul of the nation so that it can contribute to the, the what you call the universal soul of the world, of the world nations together. So that is very beautiful thing. And Auroville particular is very fortunate. We have got so many symbols in Auroville which reflect human unity. You see that when the crystal that is there in the Mati Mandir, it was being, it was commissioned in 1987. And uh, when it was being polished in Germany, then the Berlin Wall collapsed. And finally, when the crystal came to Matrimondi, it came to Auroville in April 26, 1991. And the same year, in December 26, 1991, then the USSR dissolved, which was the signal of the ending of the Cold War. So, so many significant, symbolically, it was very significant. But what I see is that, 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 that crystal there, which is reflecting human unity, has to be 
reflected or consecrated here in our own altar, in the altar of our, our own selves, and in the altar of our own nation, of our own nations, so that my psychic being develops and then can understand that how to relate with the soul of the nation. And then after that, the souls of the nations can come together and uh, all nations can adequately come together to uh, what you call uh, contribute to the world unity or to the world anthem. I think I've crossed my 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Basu. And um, before uh, moving on to the Q&A, I would just like to ask uh, Matthew and Dr. Reddy if there are any additional uh, comments that you would like to make or respond to those uh, points made by the other speakers. And maybe I'll turn to you first, Dr. Reddy. Well, uh, I'd like to add a very interesting comment by the mother. I wanted to say in the beginning, but I didn't have much time. When we speak about the different nations' roles, Mother says India's role is to be the spiritual heart of the terrestrial body, just as, for example, the role of Germany is to express skill, or that, or that of Russia, the brotherhood of man or that of the United States, enthusiasm for adventure and practical organization. France meant generosity of sentiment, newness and boldness of ideas and chivalry in action. You see, these are passing remarks, short and brief, but they could be real indicators for those of us who like to know the nation soul of many of these important countries. So the agenda the mother has given us quite many uh, descriptions of where exactly to hit the nation soul uh, identity. And that's one thing. And one more comment I wanted to say, I think Dr. Basu was, uh, has started with that. The different levels, the family, the clan, the, the substation. Show the mention that the nation has come up as the best expression of the human mind. Place like Basso, Dr. Basso said, you know, the vital, the development of physical, there's family, there's a family, there's a clan. So this is how it's, it's all growing. Even the nation's soul is growing. So on the mental level, when a particular country comes to a maximum mental level, there is a formation of the nation. So there's got to be this, that level of consciousness and now that also indicates that if we want to have any kind of a human unity or the next international body or the, or the world union, that definitely tells us that we have got to go beyond the mental level of consciousness. It's at each stage of the consciousness, there is an outer expression, be it family or this or that. So the human mind, when it has come to this best level, a nation, nature offered nation as its best body. So anything beyond national, national nationalism, we call it internationalism, we call it world body, it, it implies that humanity itself must go beyond the mental consciousness. Otherwise, we can keep talking about it for years together and just keeping on the mental level will not help us. And this would again reflect in Oroville. And Oroville has been given instructions and indications that how it's going to be the cradle of a new consciousness. How we have to move towards outer body. So it's, outer body is not just an ex expression by, by per se or by itself. It has a definite connection, an inalienable connection with the consciousness. The consciousness and the outer body go together. I mean, I find so many things that the mother has explained. I think I just wanted to add that comment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reddy. There's just a little bit of uh, internet issue there, but I'm hoping everybody was able to uh, to hear that. Um, and uh, Matthew, any any additional comments you would like to make? Um, I think this uh, this highlighting, as Dr. Reddy just did, of uh, the stages and the kind of relationship of the family, 
and different kinds of collectives, um, the ability that we have to move from an atomistic, individualized me against the world, my family against the world, my tribe against the world, my nation against the world. It gets bigger and eventually it's the world and there's no one to be against. <laughs> and so, you know, when we think about how, okay, so we have to touch our own psychic being. We have to, in order to know the soul of a nation, we have to know our own soul. The how is like that. We have to get bigger. We have to get from me against the world to, okay, who do I love that I can reach? Okay, let's bring them into the circle. And as the circle gets wider and wider, then we have a more authentic, organic, free flowing expression of our own soul uh, in relationship with all other souls. And um, of course, in myself, in the world, in nations, there is a force pushing in another direction. We can call it the Asuric force. We can call it the force of darkness. We can call it the force of falsehood. There's a force that's pushing in the other towards individualization, uh, atomization. The one, the one, the cosmic one became many on purpose. It wasn't a mistake. The one became many. And the one honors all the many. And the one sees the one, self, the one through the eyes of the many. So it became many in order to enjoy, in order to honor, in order to revere. But in the process, this atomization, which shows up in, you know, in Sankhya philosophy as a hunkar, the kind of crystallization of individuality, has been um, kind of co-opted by forces larger scale cosmic forces that seek to promote the experience of separation and, and the, you know, at the expense of the experience of unity. And so we're in that. We, we were born into this milieu. It's not our fault in a sense of we did something wrong. Oh no, you know, that I experience fear and enmity and hatred and disgust and all these things. This is the, the soup that we're all being cooked in. This is the place where we all came into. These forces are real, they're active, they're playing themselves out on the world stage, they're playing themselves out on an individual level to create separation. And in Oroville as well, to create polarization, to create me versus you, us versus them, these sides. The resolution to all of this is expanding and kind of touching into the currently existing fabric of love that holds everything together and that gives birth and life and nourishment and sustenance to all to the exclusion of none and so yeah just this this sense of the stages of individuality you could say or the stages of evolution uh, dr Basu used the word fraternity you know uh, fraternity is like love it's the sense of family, the sense of I am part of you and you are part of me that can ripple out and, and encompass the whole world. Thank you. Thank you, Matthews. And Dr. Basu, any uh, last words before we go into q and You see that these uh, three movements um, uh, uh, go together in an integral vision that one has to organize one's discordant elements around one's soul principle of the psychic being. You know, we are composed of so many different things. Our mind, vital and physical, they are not in harmony with each other. They are always in conflict. And then we have to bring them together around the central principle, which is the psychic being. And then together with that, then we have to see this, this movement has to be parallel with the movement of developing or understanding the nation's soul around which the, the nation has to be brought around. And not only the nation, because the nation has also got many heterogeneous elements. You see, a nation, every nation is not homogeneous. There are some nations which have a lot of homogeneity, but in India, uh, you don't have uh, so much homogeneity. There is a lot of heterogeneity, especially if you see the Northeastern states in India, you see that there are adjoining states like Mizoram, Nagaland, and Manipur. Each state is completely different from the other state in terms of culture, language, and others. Unbelievable. In such short 
what you call a short space is not a very big space but then everything is so different but still that was that spiritual uh, something that was a spiritual uniqueness something that was a spiritual element had held all this heterogeneity together and that we have to understand and we have to acknowledge in the people who are running uh, india people who are intellectuals academicians if they leave out that spiritual perspective they will never be able to understand the indian scenario in any other place other than india this country would not have been together it would have been broken into pieces it has not been broken into pieces or it is not being broken into pieces like that because there's the spiritual perspective and that's our great rishis who might be in the himalayan caves had wished well for all of us had breath there what you call their um, uh, that vasudeva kutumbukam that that great mantra that everybody should be together and that is why the spiritual uniqueness has to be acknowledged otherwise we will not be able to understand and from indian point i will say that uh, that our our indian national peculiarity we will not be able to project and third is together with all this that we exceed ourselves and the nation and we belong to the world so the soul of we belong also to the universal soul to the universal world so the soul in the three different poses of the global soul and the national soul the soul of the nation and then of my own psychic being as three poses of one eternal principle i think for those who have taken mother and she have in this works of integral vision of seeing a global world order in a different light it is dip, it is important to trot the three paths together simultaneously so that is an important thing Great, thank, thank you. And so we'll um, at this time just move into uh, Q&A and we've got a number of questions. So what I'll do is just read out uh, a particular question and if it's to be directed to uh, one of our speakers, I'll mention it. Otherwise, um, if all three of you uh, or any one of you would like to answer, that's fine. And we'll start with a question from Abhinav. Do the neighboring nations of India have one nation soul? Do the neighboring nations of India have one nation soul? Any of I you would like to address that? I think we discussed about it when uh, United India falling apart and USSR falling apart. So what's the difference whether the souls got divided or the soul is one? I think we talked about it. For India, it is that the soul resides in the area which mother calls the uh, spiritual map of India. So that you have to see India is a very special case. Good, thank you. Thank you. And the next one, next one uh, is directed to uh, Matthew. What is a national pavilion? Oh, um, yeah, I guess there was kind of an uh, implied um, understanding and you know, we didn't specifically talk about the national pavilions, but within Oroville, in the international zone, um, there are to be, there's a, a vision of, uh, as the mother kind of laid out, uh, national pavilions. So a place um, that, uh, you know, a physical material space that can honor and, you know, as I said, um, when I was speaking earlier, these pavilions can be a place like an incubator for the soul energy of a nation, a place to honor and revere and, um, and concentrate that soul energy so that it can ripple out and bless the earth. So these are spaces within the international zone of Oroville that would be dedicated to, you know, to this purpose. And I just want to add one thing, which is the one thing that helps me get away from abstraction and into reality is awe. So when we talk about pavilions, you know, a soul, a soul is not uh, an, an artifact. It's not an empty dead thing. It's a crystallization of the divine oneness into a unique, you know, radiant, in, uh, immortal flame. So how can a pavilion hold that sense of awe and reverence and wonder, wonder, what is a soul, you know, the, the beauty and the richness and the voice and the fragrance of a soul, how can they be reflected in a way that someone who walks into the space, <gasps> they take a breath, you know, it like it, it takes your breath away because you feel through, through the artifacts, through the pictures, through the architecture, through whatever it is, you feel through it, <gasps> that's the soul. 
you know that's that's what i imagine i feel like that's what the opportunity that's what the invitation of a pavilion is is to create a space through whatever means where when you enter into it your breath is taken away because you feel your own soul and you feel the soul of this the unique radiant flame of this nation great thank thank you matthew um, interesting question here. Is it uh, possible to influence another to be in touch with their soul? Or is it something that has to happen only from within? And anyone is free to answer that question. I, um, I'll just say something quickly since I just spoke, which is that I, I, my experience is that it is definitely possible to support someone and to especially have the intention to support someone to experience their soul, but we can't make it happen. I mean, that's between the person and the divine. The mother has to um, kind of open the door, but we can stand next to the door and we can knock on it and we can um, just acknowledge. I, there's so much power in acknowledging and holding someone's soul, someone as a soul, rather than validating the presentation. They, you know, a person may say, this is me, this is my job, this is my function, this is who I am. And we can say, smile and nod, and look directly through all that to their soul. And there is a power in that. There's an invitation in that. And there's an opportunity that we're offering them, please come forward, show yourself, be here. So we can give that opportunity, but we can't make it happen. That's that's between their, that individual being and the divine. Well, uh, there, is a, there was a question by Abhinavji regarding the thing it was about the nation soul of the neighboring countries in India. Yes. Dr. Basu has addressed that, but I'd like to add something more. You see, sometimes by human ignorance and imbecility, we do all this kind of nonsense of dividing the countries. But as we all know, Sri Aurobindo's message of 1947, 15th of August, when he told bluntly that the division will and must go. So that itself indicates that these are not permanent nations. A nation has been created artificially by the conquerors, by the Britishers. But that doesn't mean that it has, it has been given a nation soul. It has been geographically separated on some religion and all that. But there's got, got to be once again a reunion. That's what prophesied as prophesied himself. Because it is necessary for the richness of the spiritual India to have even the geographical union. Because as a mother beautifully said, the spiritual map of India, that means what? India's Bharat Mata, the Devi, the Shakti, has an external form which comprises of all these nations that have been separated by the Britishers, like even Nepal and Bangladesh. But Mother still holds that this is not the, the final shape is the full map. But yeah, how they are united, in what way, is going to be a kind of a federation or kind of, kind of one country or that political is different. They confirm you that this is the body called Bharat Mata and Bharat Shakti. So in the future, this will happen. So these smaller countries are developing souls, but not yet gained the national soul or the nation soul. Because you know, as Dr. Basu was explaining, very, very different from many other countries, India somehow gained and based its nation soul on spirituality to begin with. Unlike many other nations which had to develop themselves from, from geographical boundaries, from this national culture. But fortunate are we that Vedas and Upanishads have started and given us a spiritual soul at the very birth of the country. And because of this greatness of the spirituality, India could develop multiple levels of what you say, you know, unity in diversity. It's the only spiritual soul that can tolerate this diversity. Otherwise, Dr. Basu very rightly said, 
it could have been split up into smaller pieces. So coming back to our this question, yes, it is a matter of time that all these broken parts have to come back, reunite in any political dimension you want, but it will be the body of Bharat Prata. That's what I like to add there. And uh, somebody asked, uh, how can we understand the soul of a nation, of a new nation that oppressed the soul of the native nations like USA or Brazil or others? Well, uh, you know, it's easy to, I mean, go through and we say this oppression, like USA has oppressed some, some other native countries, etc. But I think when these native countries also develop, because as we insisted, Dr. Basu and Dr. Mr. Matthew, and we have all insisted that there is a, a kind of a, an evolution of a country. Nation soul is not a, I mean, the spiritual soul or the soul of the country doesn't come in one day or one century, one year. So there's a development. So this oppressed nation also, so called, if it can gain that nation soul, that spiritual soul or the, or the soul identity itself, then it will become a separate part or it will merge with the, like the, the totality of USA or Brazil or something. So in the beginning it is difficult to identify if this oppressed nation has any any kind of a nation. So it will take time. Well. Culturally we can identify the native culture and matter, but who knows why the culture has been oppressed. Maybe, you know, I am taking only the example of India about other countries are not so much, much of the history. But in India, we, those of us who know Indian history, we have been oppressed many times. Different conquerors came and all kinds of conquests have happened. But India never died. Because it took them all in a stride. And in fact, in one of the lines, Sri Ramana says, all the religions that have come into in our country have been purposely brought in into, into India so that they can all be merged, united and coalesced. That is the mission of the country. So similarly, sometimes these aliens or they, they say foreigners, they come and to give some kind of a push to awaken his tamas, to awaken his sleeping vital, his, uh, awakening his mantle. But Indian soul has been basically spiritually oriented. So it could learn from all these things and, and take new bodies see, each time. So that has been the genius of the country because of which it has survived thousands and thousands of years of culture, you know, conquest and everything. So it's a very complex chapter, I suppose, to see all this. Yeah, thank you. I would just add to this, Radhe, if you give me a few minutes, i just add to this about USA. Please. And um, that USA and Australia are very special cases where people from outside came. But about uh, but a lot of injustice uh, had already been also had been done to the original uh, indigenous people who are there. And unless that is corrected, the full prosperity of the uh, the soul of these two nations uh, that will not come into front. But of the USA, I can also say this, having said this, that because many different people came together from many different parts of the world in USA and they formed a very new paradigm, which is a very exceptional thing. Without past heritage, people coming together, forming a new paradigm. And in that paradigm, we see there are two important things. We see that there were also groups in Europe who are spiritual groups, like the Quakers community, Shakers community, originally they also came from Europe. And they also brought their, some spiritual things there they brought into there and also the spirit of the indigenous people were there. So there was, even we don't understand it outwardly, inwardly there was a spiritual heritage, something brought by the spiritual groups who are not, uh, who, who, who are not in um, comfort with the Vatican, who had come there to the USA, like for example, Mother Mary Ann would not have been liked by the Vatican being an omen. And because of this, something spiritual was there, that 400 years of American independence was celebrated by having the world parliament of religions where Swami Vivekananda came. I mean, I mean, I mean to say that with Swami Vivekananda's meeting there, which actually bridged the East and the West, which are very spiritually significant thing, didn't come in a vacuum. It had some spiritual heritage. Now, of course, for the USA to develop and to bring all the indigenous people who also feel that they have not been properly um, given their due importance. That is a very big task that is remaining as an outsider that I think. I think that an 
insider like Matthew will be able to tell better. But for as an outsider, or rather you can also tell me better, but as an outsider who have been observing these things for me, I think that this is also a perspective that has to be considered. Absolutely. So I would also just encourage any of the uh, panelists, if there is, uh, you can open the Q&A box. If there's any questions there very specifically you would like to address, um, please do. Otherwise, I can continue to read. But uh, you may want to just scan down and uh, see if there's anything specific um, that you would like to address. I just um, quickly want to respond to Dr. Basu's uh, not not as an expert on, on the USA, but uh, it you know this idea that the Parliament of the World Religions happened in a specific place at a specific time for a specific reason that was decreed by the divine, despite the limitations of America, despite the colonial history, despite the history of slavery, despite the history of uh, genocide of Native Americans. So these things are real. They happened, but the divine worked within, you know, humanity and the human consciousness is evolving. And so there's certain things that are possible at a certain time and, and, and others that are not. And at the time of the founding of, of the United States, there was a divine dream that was implanted in the earth in a particular place that used the resources of that place, the people who were there, the indigenous people, the, you know, everyone who was involved was brought together in this way. And the human reality was such that it could only manifest itself at that time in a limited way. And so the genocide of the Native Americans and slavery and post-slavery anti-Black racism and Jim Crow and all the ways of oppression and then America's international oppression of other nations and all these things, they're real manifestations of the human limitation that's taking place at a specific time, even as the divine one is there pushing, pushing, pushing. And sometimes there can be a breakthrough, like the Parliament of World Religions were, you know, the, the, my understanding, I don't know that this is true, my understanding is that the Parliament of World Religions was brought together by a bunch of Christian missionaries, a bunch of Christian people who said, let's bring all the religions together so that we can demonstrate why Christianity is more, <laughs> is better, right? So they bring everybody together and there's all the different religions represented and they're thinking, yes, we're going to demonstrate, we're going to prove to the world that Christianity is better. Vivekananda gets up there and he talks and there's 18 minutes of applause, right? People are just dumbstruck. They're blown apart by Vivekananda. So it's like the divine comes and uses the space that's provided, even if people think all people can think whatever they want, people can be on whatever wavelength. So I just thought that was a very good and poignant example uh, of, of this tension between the reality and the ideal that exists. You know, this is what we're always in the face of is the tension between the reality and the ideal. And how can the ideal pull us forward more towards greatness, towards aspiration, towards love, towards truth? And how can we honor the reality without dismissing it, without bypassing it, we, without ignoring it, we have to atone and be, uh, I mean, I, I personally feel that we, as, as any citizen of, of the United States has to uh, face the past and face the karma, whether or not we want to do it, it will happen. This is the function of karma, it will happen. And so, uh, yeah, I just thought that was a very good poignant example Dr. Basu brought up. And then uh, you are very right, because that year is very special, 1893, because you see the World Parliament of Religions is happening. The same year, Sri Aurobindo is coming to India to bring open a new chapter. And the same year, Mahatma Gandhi is traveling to South Africa to bring nonviolence as a uh, tool. So you see, it is also divine providence that this that year was a very marked year, that all these things should happen in different parts of the world. Yes. Okay, maybe we've got time here for uh, one other question. So let me just uh, look through here or if any of the panelists see a uh, question that they would like to address as we start to, uh, to close. Dr. Basu, there's one there for you on Satna Dharma. 
it's often being given a very narrow meaning as well as caste system, as you mentioned. Please do expand and clarify this as per Sri Aurobindo's vision. So these are things that take time. We could do it, uh, but uh, uh, to be very short, that spiritual universalism, which Sri Aurobindo espoused, is something which is very, which is a very big thing, and um, uh, it's the, it cannot be confined to narrow boundaries. If you see Upar Para speech, you have to read it again and again and again. The Upar Para speech, then to understand what Sri means by the Sanatan Dharma. And that spiritual universalism is something which is all inclusive. It is not exclusive. And that it, you see, it gives a passage from nationalism to internationalism very smoothly. And that is why it is so important from, from in Sri Aurobindo's socio-political perspective, as, which is equally important as the spiritual perspective. And they all collate with each other. It's not like that. But the caste system is a different story. Now the caste system today, you see, it is, the, um, there were the four principles which were represented by wisdom, uh, strength, stability, and service that were used at that time, at that age, at the age of social stratification, which Sri Aurobindo said that the first stage of nation unit formation to bring a, a, a stratified social order. But these four principles which were there, which outwardly they have, they are not relevant now in the way they were given that time, but the four principles are still there and they can be brought together, which Sri Aurobindo says, in a new denouement, these things can be brought together. This wisdom, this strength, this stability and this service as four aspects of personality, represented by Maheshwari, Mahakali, Mahalakshmi, and Mahasharashuti, they can be brought together in our personality. So the four principles which were first, uh, which first came out from the divine being and which were intuitively perceived were used for one type of construction at that time of social stratification. Now those four principles, they are there. You see that social stratification, we don't we have surplus that. We don't need to uh, get glued to that thing because it has served this purpose. We have outgrown it. But the four principles are still there. They're equally relevant and they can be now used to construct a personality with four attributes simultaneously. The, with, where I simultaneously I have my knowledge, I have my strength, I have my stability, and I have my, my sense of service and surrender, and all integrated around a center. So that is, you see, the principles can now be used for a different synthesis. It was used for a social synthesis at that time. It can be used for a psychological synthesis today. So that's how I see it, that you can understand the principles of the caste system. So it's a very different subject. We can talk about it some other day, some other time, in details, if that way is uh, receptive to it or supports it. Sure, it's a vast topic. Now, uh, of course, he's a Sanskrit scholar now, so I have to be very careful. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, I know there are still a few questions uh, remaining. Uh, we'll capture these questions and send them out to our panelists so that they are addressed. And uh, we are pretty much at our, our time limit here, but uh, we would ask if everyone could just stay with us. We will be closing with a group meditation in a moment. Um, I did want to thank very sincerely our esteemed panelists today for uh, such an enlightening discussion and on a very important and obviously timey timely uh, topic. So thank you three all very much, much appreciated. And we hope everybody can join us uh, tomorrow. The uh, topic will be the practical manifestation of the city and the role of UNESCO and GOI. Uh, guest speakers will be Sri Arun Ravi and Chandresh Patel. So please join us. And with that, uh, stay with us and uh, close in our group meditation. Savitur Paramarupam Jyoti Hipparasya Dhimahi Yannaha Satya Nadipaye Satya Nadipaye Om Tat 
सवितूर्भरमूपम ज्योति परीमे यत्यन दीप सत्यन दीप So again, thank you all very much for uh, staying with us through that meditation and for joining us today. Hope to see you tomorrow. Namaste to all.